to start a new series this morning about prayer. Someone suggested <laughs> recently that we could talk about prayer, so uh, we're going to put some lessons together and, and learn about that. But I would begin by asking, you know, how's your prayer life? How's your prayer life? How's my prayer life? I, I have to admit, I, I'm not what you'd probably call a prayer warrior. Uh, I've known some people like that. And uh, I admire those folks. I've got some things to learn, so I'm going to be learning with you as we go along. Uh, I did some research uh, on the internet, and the internet's always right, so I looked through and found some statistics on prayer that may or may not surprise you. This is from the Pew Research Center. One quote says, in a typical week, two out of three American adults, 66% pray at least once. At least, at, I want to say that more direct statistics at about 50%. I think it was prayed at least once a day. And then another 16% said once a week. So that's how you get your 66%. Another one out of 10 adults, or 10%, prays at least once a month. Only one out of seven, or 15%, said they never pray, making prayer the nation's most widely practiced religious activity. I haven't thought about that until I read it. And there are a lot of religious activities that religious people participate in, but prayer would probably be the, the most common one, because that's something most of us probably practice outside the confines of the walls of the church building. But some of those statistics might surprise you. But compare yourself to those averages. Where are you at on perhaps that scale? Prayer is all over the Bible. If you've studied your Bible, both Old and New Testaments, it seems like there's always people praying about this or that. Perhaps the closest, you know, again, prayers throughout the scriptures, but Nowhere do we find really a detailed explanation of it. It's just something that's accepted as part of what's going on. I'm not aware of, of a, a book or a letter in the New Testament devoted to prayer. Perhaps the closest the Bible comes to an explanation of prayer would be the words of Jesus in response to the disciples' request. Remember that some of the disciples came to Jesus and said, teach us to pray. Find that in Luke 11 or Matthew chapter 6. And Jesus does give them an example of prayer. So that might be the closest we have in Scripture to a prayer seminar. And I guess if Jesus is teaching the seminar, you better pay attention. Uh, my guess is later on in these lessons, we'll deal in particular with what is referred to as the Lord's Prayer. That'd be one place. There are some other places and some parables Jesus deals with it, but for the most part, it's just an accepted practice, something that was going on and probably had been going on. You know, even, even people who worship false gods are involved in prayer. So you've got that as well. But due to the fact that there's no direct book-wide or letter-wide teaching about Scripture, we're left to take what is revealed about it and the examples we have and use those things to form our understanding. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to go through the Old and New Testaments and, and take what examples we have about prayer and learn some things, hopefully. At least that's, that's the goal. Prayer, in that sense, is just like other some other Bible topics. You've got what's referred to as the Godhead or the relationship between God, the Father, and Jesus the Son and, and the Holy Spirit of God. Some people call it the Trinity, some refer to it as the Godhead, but prayer is like that because there's no place where that doctrine is, is explained in great detail. It's just accepted, and we accept it by faith. It's kind of the same thing with the work of the Holy Spirit. There's no seminar given on the Holy Spirit in the Bible. We just take what the Bible teaches. So prayer is much like that. So what is prayer then? We want to start this morning in this lesson by just kind of giving some basic definitions and talking about it in that sense. Sometimes it helps when you're trying to answer a question about what something is to start by describing what it's not. That's how I want to start this morning. To answer the question, let's begin by reminding ourselves of some things that prayer should not be. And I thought about the wording there, and I was going to say, I had it initially in my notes, I was going to say, prayer is not this. 
prayer is not that, but uh, often our prayers fall into these categories. So I decided to say these are things prayer should not be. Uh, because even when we're, we realize sometimes prayer it shouldn't be that, we do it anyway. But think about, or maybe you can relate to some of these things. Number one, some things prayer should not be. Number one is a key to a cosmic vending machine. Prayer is not a key to a cosmic vending machine. But sometimes I think we fall into that, that mindset. I, I kind of hear it in the words of, of John and James, two of two brothers who were disciples, two of the twelve of Jesus' closest disciples. You remember in Mark chapter 10, James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and, and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. <laughs> That's a bold thing. And the disciples are still learning at this point in their journey, but Jesus, do for us what we ask you. I think sometimes our prayers fall into that category, category that we, maybe we don't think about prayer too much till we have something we need, and then we pray to God. And it's just like maybe going to that vending machine and, well, I, I want the, the uh, Coke Zero there and put the money in and pull the slot, and I get what, what I want. But prayer, of course, I don't believe is designed to do that. Sometimes God grants our prayers, right? But sometimes we pray fervently for something, and and uh, we don't get what we ask for. There's some various reasons for that, and no doubt there'll be a lesson later talking about some of that as we, we get through it. But prayer, I don't believe, is a key to a cosmic vending machine. Number two, I don't think prayer is designed to be an effort to educate God. But I've heard some of my prayers fall into that category as well, right? You know, we go through our prayer list of people we're praying for, and uh, Lord, I'm praying for Sister So-and-So, who you know is the daughter of Brother So-and-So, and so God knows all of that, don't we? And maybe it's because we're nervous about addressing the Father, but God knows what we need before we ask it, the Bible tells it. But it doesn't preclude us praying for what we need. God encourages us to do that. But it's not because we're reminding God and God's like, wait, I forgot about that. I was going to answer that prayer last week and I didn't get to it. No, God knows before we ask. So prayer really is an exercise in Perhaps that benefits us rather than educating God. Prayer shouldn't be that. Number three, prayer should not be reserved for the super spiritual or eloquent. By that I mean sometimes maybe you felt, well, I don't feel adequate to, to talk to the creator of the universe, and that's okay. Uh, humility before God's a great thing to have, but, but uh, sometimes... We might get to thinking, well, I just don't know the words, or you know, brother or sister so-and-so says it better than I do. Or, uh, the only people who can approach God would be those that are closest to him. And in that connection, this, I don't have this in my notes, but it just came to my head. I'm thinking of, of the uh, example Jesus gives of the, the Pharisee, I believe, the tax gatherer, you know, and the Pharisee is praying to God and complimenting himself on how good he was at this or that. Tax together, just won't, won't even lift his eyes to God. Just put his prayer is, God be merciful to me as a sinner. There wasn't an eloquent man or a super spiritual man, but God heard his prayer. So you don't have to be super spiritual or elo eloquent to be a person of prayer. But I also believe prayer should not be something that's viewed as the last resort. Right? Uh, you know. We're Americans here, and we're kind of, most of us have been raised, especially the older generations of, you know, well, we'll get ourselves, we'll raise ourselves up by our own bootstraps, right? We'll get it done, that type of thing. Well, that's okay within within boundaries, but yet I don't believe God wants prayer to be something that when all else fails, turn to me, God would say. No, I think it might ought to be the first resort. Include God in whatever's going on in our lives. So don't hold on to that as, as the card you'll play. Well, I'm at, I'm at my wits end now. I don't know what else I can do. So maybe God can help. Don't fall into that trap. Finally, prayer should not be an attempt to manipulate or control God. Uh, and I think here in connection with 
might use the example of uh, the battle between Elijah and the 450 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. I believe it's first or second Kings chapter 18, one of the under those two. Anyway, you remember the prophets of Baal? Basically, that was going to be a prayer contest, right? They were just going to have their altar and call up on their God to bring down fire from heaven to light uh, the sacrifice and burn it up. And the prophets of Baal all day long uh, controlled their God and begged him and cut themselves. And anyway, in essence, trying to manipulate their God and he wouldn't answer. And of course, then you've got the example of, of Elijah who just so humbly prays to God and boom, it happens. Well, again, sometimes perhaps we fall into the trap of our prayers being an effort on our part to, to manipulate God. God, if, if you'll just answer this prayer in this way, I'll do this. I'll go to preaching school, Lord, if you'll answer my prayer. Or, you know, if, if this happens, I'll do that. Well, I suppose we could bargain with God, but, but uh, we're going to be on the bad end of that uh, as well. So again, think about some of those things, and, and you can think about your own prayer life. And maybe, like me, it's easy to fall into these attempts at prayer that go in directions that might be, be troublesome. And I guess we'll be, as we go through the Bible and look at some of the prayers of some men and women, you'll see some of that. But you probably heard some of it in modern day as well. But it's, again, we'll ask the question, what is prayer? Well, I think at its base, this is the way I would put it, prayer is communication with God, right? It can happen in a lot of different ways. But at the base level, prayer is communication with God. Here's the definition from dictionary.com. Uh, a prayer, according to that dictionary, is a, a devout petition to God or, or some other object of worship. A spiritual communication with God or an object of worship. See, they got to throw that other thing in to, to uh, appease the people who don't believe in God. Because people pray to things in our world as well. They did in the time of the, of the Bible. Uh, supplication, thanksgiving, adoration, or confession. Now that's a lot of words there. But bottom line, prayer is communication with God. I think that's a pretty good, simple way to put it. As I thought about that, though, I like to describe prayer in these ways, three, three different ways. Think about how these might be preferable to some of those other things we talk, talk about. I would describe prayer as a bridge into the presence of, of God himself, all right? Not a portal, you science fiction fans, but uh, let me read for you a short psalm, Psalm 8. And perhaps the, the psalmist had this concept in mind as, as they penned these words. Psalm 8. Psalm 8 reads this way. It says, O oh Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I consider the work of your, uh, of your, when I consider your heavens, rather, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him? And the son of man, that you care for him. Yet you have made him a little lower than God. You crown him with glory and majesty. You make him rule over the work of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes through the paths of the sea, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now there are some New Testament writers that take Psalm 8 and make a specific application to Jesus. That happens in Hebrews in one place. But here, I don't think the psalmist has in mind Jesus Christ. He's talking about just the exalted place God has given humankind in his created order. When I say prayer is a bridge into the presence of God, I'm thinking of the fact that what a great privilege it is we've been given to communicate with the creator of the universe. We get to talk to him. And he encourages us to do so. Why would God, why does God give us that kind of thought? Because he loves us. 
In Psalm 145, in verse 18, it says, The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who, to all who call upon him in truth. To call upon the Lord is another way of, of saying prayer. We communicate with God. What a great privilege it is. And God could have just as well chosen to create the world and humankind in, in, connection, in connection with that. It says, you know what, you guys just handle it down there. I don't want you to bother me anymore. And there are you know, a deist would probably believe the world works that way. But that isn't what the God of the Bible talks about. So prayer is a bridge into the presence of God, the very creator of the universe. Number two, prayer is an answer to the invitation of God. God invites us to pray to him. We have that invitation as his children. First Kings chapter 3 First Kings chapter 3, verses 5 through 13. I'm going to make myself turn to it today. Usually I have these verses in my notes so I can refer to them right quickly. And I see this week I forgot to do that. <laughs> so I have to hunt them down. First Kings 3, starting in verse 5. This, of course, is in context Solomon's prayer. It says, In Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and God said, Ask what you wish me to give you. Can you imagine being communicating with God, and God gives you that opportunity? Son or daughter, what do you want? <laughs> then Solomon said, You have shown great love and kindness to your servant David, my father, according to all, according as he walked before you in truth and righteousness and uprightness of heart toward you and you have reserved for him this great loving kindness but you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day now O lord my god you have made your servant king in place of my father david yet i am but a little child i do not know how to go out or to come in your servant is in the midst of your people which you have chosen a great people who are too many to be numbered or considered Count it rather. So now Solomon's going to finally get to, to the request he's going to make of God. So give your servant an understanding heart to judge between your people, to discern between good and evil. Who is able? Who is able to judge this great people of yours? Uh, would, would it have been if Solomon would have kept this attitude throughout his his life? Sadly, he didn't. But at this point, he'd humbly ask God uh, for. Really, some not, not simple things, but perhaps some things that you might not think that he would have asked for. Here's God's reaction to Solomon's request. Verse 10. It was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon asked this thing. God said to him, Because you have asked this thing, and have not asked for yourself long life, nor have you asked for riches for yourself, or have asked for the life of your enemies. You see what God's doing? You know, God says, you know, I, I would expect these kind of things from most people with a blank check. But have asked for yourself discernment to understand justice. Behold, I've done according to your words. Behold, I've given you a wise and discerning heart so that there may be no one like you before you, and shall, and nor shall one be like you after you. I have also given you what you have asked, not asked rather, both riches and honor, so that there will not be any among the kings like you all your days. But our point being here, God invited Solomon to ask. Then you've got places like Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs 15, verse 29. Proverbs are full of wise sayings. And part of those wise sayings involve this invitation of God. Proverbs 15, 29 says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. Right? In a sense there, God, again, wants to hear from his people. Base, base statement. It's not that God can't hear. An unbeliever. We have examples in Scripture about that. We'll get to that eventually as well. But it is a matter of the heart. But God still wants to talk with us. 
Then Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, a great verse on prayer in the New Testament. Paul says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make let your requests be made known to God. Now, if you believe in the inspiration of the scriptures, this is God speaking through Paul. So what's God doing? Inviting us to let our requests be made known to him. What a privilege, again, what a great privilege. Doesn't God have a lot to do? Yeah, he runs the universe, but he wants to hear from you and I. So prayer really is an answer to the invitation of God. Finally, I would describe prayer as a conduit into the power and the provision of God. A conduit into the power and provision of God. We, you think back to Psalm 8 that we read earlier. We serve a God who spoke the universe into, into existence. That's a powerful God. And throughout the scriptures, especially the Old Testament, God periodically gets in these battles with the false gods of the nations. I'm thinking of the example of, of Egypt, right? Egypt in the days of Moses was the most powerful nation on earth, Pharaoh being the most powerful person among the Egyptians, and God went toe-to-toe -to -toe with every god represented in the Egyptian hierarchy through the plagues and defeated each one. Then he, he, he did battle with Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. On and on it goes. Periodically, God gave his people every reason to believe that he is over every god. He is powerful over every god. In James chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Did you catch that? No. Let's just say in my, in my life, the area I'm weak in is wisdom. God here invites us to ask him for wisdom. How does God want to answer that prayer? With great power and provision. He says, let him ask of God, pray to God about that. God says, yeah, I want to give it to you generously and without reproach. Then later in James chapter 5 and verse 16, we have an example that James uses. And it goes back to the time of uh, verses 16 and 17. Notice what he says. It says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. That'd be a righteous man or woman. I don't think it's, it's leaving the ladies out there. There are righteous women as well. But the prayer, the effective prayer of a righteous person can accomplish much. Well, how do you know that, James? Well, he gives us an example in verse 17. He brings up Elijah. We talked about him a little while ago. He says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Now, did Elijah do that by his power? No. But he prayed to the one who has the power to turn off the rain not only for three years and six months, but for eternity if he wanted to. That's God. God has that kind of power. But that was that, it, that came about through the prayer of, of a prophet. Conduit into the power and provision of God. Then let me read Ephesians chapter 3. These are great verses out of all great verses in Ephesians. Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21, right at the end of chapter 3. Prayer works into these verses. It says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. Who is he talking about there? God or Jesus? One or the other in context. But catch those words again. Now to him who is able to do what? far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. So that tells me, no, you know, whatever wild idea I can come up in my mind, how God could answer this prayer or request, God's able to do more than that, more than I can even envision. 
according to the power that works within us, not our own power, it's God's power, to him, Paul says, be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Not only is prayer this bridge into the presence of God such a privilege to approach him, not only does God invite us to do that, but God stands ready in his time and in his way and in his measure to answer our prayers with great power and provision. We could point to numerous other verses on each one of those points, but I think that suffices to make the point. I think those ideas describe prayer pretty well. Lord willing, as we go through these lessons, we'll start by examining some examples of prayer in the Old Testament. Lord willing, we'll get to the prayer life of Jesus, apostles, and the New Testament. But even though there's no place in the scriptures that spends chapters you know talking about prayer and how this works and how how you ought to do it when we get done hopefully we'll have a, a composite picture that will suffice pretty well for everything we need to know about the process in our life let's pray father help us to understand the privilege we have in approaching you this day not only this day but at any point in our life father you stand ready to hear our prayers You're not far from each one of us Yet we pray, Father, that you would help us to understand the power that lies within you and your willingness to help us in whatever way that's best, Father. Father, we know that our prayers aren't always answered according to what we would think was, would be best. Father, and help us to trust you for that. But we do acknowledge that you're a great God and that you uh, do for us what's necessary. Help us to communicate it with you. Make that a 